A cold, wet day on the desolate expanse of Saddleworth Moor near Manchester, 1987. A small army of policemen and detectives armed with shovels combed the bracken, moss, heather and long grass. Directed by a handcuffed middle-aged man, they begin digging at various spots. Sometimes they found what they were looking for, sometimes not. It was hard to tell if their reluctant guide was leading them astray or not. He was known to be a highly manipulative individual and loved the idea of being the one in control. If the police found anything, it was because he had chosen this place as one to be found. But there would be other places that he would refuse to give up. He needed to retain that delusional sense of godlike control. That man was one half of Britain's sickest serial killers. Along with his lover and partner in crime, they would snuff out the lives of five young children. Today, Descent into Darkness examines one of the most evil series of murders in the history of the British Isles. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, The Moor's Murderers. Ian Brady was born Ian Duncan Stewart on the 2nd of January 1938 in Glasgow, Scotland, to Margaret Stewart, known to her friends as Peggy, who worked as a cafe waitress. The identity of Ian's father remains a bit of a mystery to this day. Peggy had said that he was a local journalist who had sadly died around three months before baby Ian was born. The so-called good old days were not so good to single mothers. Peggy was unable to support her baby on her meagre income and she was forced to give him up to a foster family a few months later. John and Mary Sloan took little Ian into their care, giving him their surname, although Peggy did maintain regular contact with her boy whilst he was growing up. Ian discovered a love for the great outdoors during a holiday to Loch Lomond when he was nine years old and had performed well enough academically that he was accepted into the Shoreland Secondary School, which only took above average students. However, when he was in his early teens, Ian's behaviour became progressively worse, becoming a real tearaway. He appeared before magistrates on charges of burglary on two separate occasions before the age of 15. When he left school, he took the menial job of a tea boy at the Glasgow branch of the famous shipbuilders Harland and Wolfe. And this did not last long, as nine months later he switched to another job as a butcher's boy. During this time, he found himself a girlfriend named Evelyn Grant but she had been caught out when Ian had discovered that she had gone dancing with another boy. In a fit of rage, the intensely jealous and arrogant Ian threatened Evelyn with a switchblade. For this act, plus a further eight charges, the 17-year-old lad was placed on probation and then ordered that he must return to living with his birth mother. By this time, Peggy had moved to Manchester to live with her new partner, an Irish-born greengrocer by the name of Patrick Brady. Generously, Patrick got the young Ian a new job at Smithfield Market as a porter. It was hard work, but Ian appeared to take to it initially. But it did not last, however. Old habits die hard. Ian, who had now taken Patrick's surname, was caught trying to smuggle a large sack full of stolen lead from the market with the intention of weighing it in at a local scrapyard. For this breach of his probation, he was sentenced to three months in prison. He was incarcerated at Manchester's infamous Strangeways Prison. He bought copies of books on the Third Reich, the Holocaust, a Teach Yourself German book, the works of the Marquis de Sade, and a copy of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. He read them intensely, fascinated and enthralled by the extreme ideology of Nazism, lapping up the lurid details of the Holocaust and various other Nazi crimes. The more extreme of these publications came to warp Brady's perception of morality and sex, blurring the lines between right and wrong and a deep-seated desire to act out the fantasies that began to fill his mind. After his release from prison, Brady took a job in the bookkeeping department at a Gorton-based chemical company. His new colleagues regarded him as a bit of a loner with a fiery temper and a violent streak if triggered. It was here that he began to take notice of a certain stunning blonde typist. Myra Hindley was born on the 23rd of July 1942 in the Crumpsall area of Manchester. Her parents were Robert and Nellie, and they lived in the heavily industrialised area of Gorton, famous for its huge locomotive works and proud engineering history. Robert, an ex-para, was a violent drunk who would regularly abuse his wife and daughter, slapping them around for the pettiest of perceived infractions. As Myra grew, her dad taught her to fight and defend herself, 
a valuable skill in the rough working class streets in which she grew up. She learned how to throw a proper punch as Robert had been a champion boxer whilst in the forces and she also took up judo. She was a devout Catholic and regularly attended the monastery of St Francis, standing only a short distance from the Steelworkers Arms pub in which her father drank. Myra was captivated by this beautiful building. Classical icons of Catholic decor enchanted her, the bold colours and murals, high stained glass windows forcing one to look heavenward, had a profound effect on the young girl, who saw it as a place of peace and sanctuary, set amidst the squalid, tightly packed streets of Gorton, a place to escape. Upon leaving school, Hindley went through a couple of typist jobs at various firms before, finally, three years later, settling on the offices of Chemical Distribution Company, Millwood's Merchandise Limited. Brady and Hindley's paths finally and fatefully crossed in 1961. Hindley was still working in the typing pool and, and Brady in the bookkeeping department. She immediately became intrigued by the dark, mysterious, moody-looking Brady. Perhaps she saw the 23-year-old Scottish lad as a dashing Heathcliff-type character. Hindley, with her shock of peroxide blonde hair, stood out as a rare young beauty, no stranger to the affections of potential suitors. But there was something about this man. He remained almost aloof and distant, seemingly not eager to lavish attention on her. This had the effect of making the young Myra becoming increasingly drawn to the bad boy. I guess the old male adage of women love a bastard held true here, if only everyone had known just how much of a bastard he would turn out to be. After a little back and forth in a will-they-won't-they they scenario, the two eventually did. Becoming a couple, they began to spend all the time together they could. They regularly went up to Saddleworth Moor on Ian's motorbike whenever the weather was good, Brady taking along his camera to capture every moment he could. Brady soon began to instill his twisted ideals on his new girlfriend. Religion was weakness, the fulfilment of one's sexual pleasure, the ultimate taboo that should be explored to its fullest. By taking away the religion in her life, he created the perfect blank canvas upon which he could paint his own visions, his sexual sadism, his emerging psychopathy, and his total rejection of established societal values. Hindley was a willing student, fully taken in by the beguiling, manipulative Brady, with whom she was completely besotted. Ian moved in with Myra and her grandmother in a house in Bannock Street in June 1963. Soon after, Brady came to share his thoughts with Myra about how to commit, as he saw it, the perfect murder. He had read a book called Compulsion by Mayor Levin, which had explored this exact premise. Ian had meticulously sculpted his ultimate fantasy of abducting a child, having his way with them, and then killing them and burying them upon their beloved moor. Hindley would have a pivotal role to play in the procurement of the intended targets. Everyone knows you don't talk to men you don't know, but a kind lady? Well, that was different. No one ever warns you about them. Twelfth of July, nineteen sixty three. Pauline Reed, aged sixteen. After long and exhaustive planning by Brady, the couple had purchased a small van derived from a mini and had begun stalking the streets for the perfect victim. Unfortunately, on the twelfth of July, nineteen sixty three, they found what they were looking for. A little after nineteen thirty, Myra Hindley had turned the van into Froxmas Street and saw a young girl walking along the road ahead. Ian was following on his motorbike. He also noticed the young lass and signalled Hindley by flashing his headlights that this was the one he wanted. Hindley pulled the van into the side a little ahead of the 16-year-old and rolled down the window. Hindley recognised Pauline Reed as she had known her since she was a wee nipper, being at the same school as Myra's younger sister, Maureen. This created the perfect conversation starter for Myra, who struck up a chat with her. She had used the weak pretense that she had lost one of her gloves up on Saddleworth Moor, and would Pauline come to help her find it? The trusting Pauline readily agreed and got into the van, and they set off for the moor. Brady followed close behind them. Hindley took Pauline up onto the moor, and stopped at a predetermined point on the A635 road that links Manchester with Barnsley, South Yorkshire. They got out and began searching for the supposed lost glove. Brady had stopped a little way off and dismounted his bike. After checking the coast was clear, slowly crept up and pounced. He pinned the young Pauline down, 
brutally raped her and then slashed her throat twice. One of these cuts was around four inches in length right across the larynx. Brady had then also shoved the collar of her coat into the incisions. Hindley later recalled that she could hear the agonising sounds of Pauline Reed choking and bleeding to death in the darkness, although Brady later claimed that she had actively participated in the whole event, including the rape. Whatever happened, she had reached the point of no return. The young devout Catholic girl was no more. She was now fully immersed in the twisted world of Ian Brady, on their joint roller coaster ride to hell. Once Reed was dead, Ian and Myra buried their victim a short walk from the roadside, and then drove off home. Pauline Reed's remains were found in 1987, with Brady guiding the police where to dig. 23rd of November 1963. John Kilbride, age 12. Brady and Hindley happened upon 12-year-old John Kilbride in the evening near to a market in Ashton-under-Lyme. They were driving a Ford Anglia that the pair had hired, presumably for their next victim. John was a very happy, typical young boy who loved football and would, could often be heard whistling the theme tune to the then-popular British cop show Z Cars. The couple had offered young John a lift home, with them convincing him that his parents would be worried sick if he were out so late. The innocence of his youth led him to believe the seemingly kind couple. So, as he climbed into the vehicle, his fate was sealed. Whilst they were supposedly on their way back to John's house, the couple suggested a quick detour up to the moor. They'd used the same excuse before, that Myra had lost a glove up there earlier, and that they had to try and find it. Once they were up on the moor, Brady led Kilbride away. He sexually assaulted the boy, and then tried to slit his throat with a serrated blade, but instead, finally opting to strangle him with a length of cord. John's brother, Terry, recalled a few years ago, in another documentary, that he was still able to recall the night that John disappeared. Young Terry and his two other younger brothers had been sent to bed early that night, and John, who had a small job helping at the nearby market, had simply never come home. John was never late home. Never. John's parents, after sending Terry and his siblings off to bed, had gone out with a few friends and neighbours looking for wee John. With no sign of the lad, by 2030 hours, his mother called the police and reported him missing. At the time, no one suspected that anything bad could have happened to him, but that innocence and naivety had quickly faded after the day turned to a week and then into months. Terry recounted that his mother would spend her day staring out the window, tears rolling down her face, hoping in vain that her John would suddenly turn into the front garden gate. She even continued to buy bigger clothes, just in case he did come back. The joy had been completely ripped from her life. She never expressed any happiness ever again. There is another very interesting interview with Terry Kilbride and the wife of another brother, Danny, who share their recollections to another YouTuber called Luke Kelly. Go over and show him some love. Link in the description. John Kilbride's remains were discovered in a shallow grave on the opposite side of the road from where Pauline Reed was buried in 1965. Sometime in 1964, Ian, Myra and her grandma were rehoused by the local authority as part of a new scheme of slum clearances. The trio were placed in a new home in the council estate in Hattersley at number 16 Wardlebrook Avenue. Of course, such an upheaval would never be allowed to get in the way of Brady's grand plans. The killings were far from over yet. Although strangely, they did befriend an 11-year-old girl named Patricia Hodges who lived a few doors up at number 12. Brady and Hindley had taken her up to Saddleworth Moor to gather some peat from the boggy ground to help with the poor state of their gardens. In an effort for cost reduction and speed, the builders of the new estate had not bothered putting any topsoil in the gardens of the houses, and had simply been left with a grim mix of dense clay and discarded rubble. Not much was ever going to grow in that. Hodges never came to any form of harm from Brady or Hindley, most likely because she lived far too close to home. The couple may have been sick in the head, but that didn't make them stupid. 16th of June 1964 Keith Bennett, age 12. Twelve-year-old Keith Bennett was making his way to his grandmother's house in the Manchester district of Longsight when he had a fateful encounter with the Moors murderers. Hindley had stopped and asked him for help in loading some boxes into her van, then she would take him to where he wanted to be. Once again, the couple used the lame excuse of a lost glove to take a detour up to Saddleworth Moor. Hindley stopped the van in a lay-by on the left side of the road, and Brady got out retrieved a spade from the back, 
and beckoned young Keith out of the vehicle, and the pair walked off out of sight, leaving Hindley behind, or so she would always claim. Some time later, Brady returned to the lay-by alone, the now muddied spade over his shoulder. He had first sexually assaulted the twelve-year-old and then strangled him with a length of string, burying his body somewhere in the vicinity. Keith Bennett's body was never found. On the 15th of August 1964, Hindley's youngest sister Maureen had suddenly gotten married to her partner David Smith at the registry office in a very much shotgun-style wedding. Maureen was seven months pregnant and had clearly embarrassed the family as none of them chose to attend. The day after the wedding, Ian Brady suggested that the four of them take a short break up to Windermere in the Lake District, this being despite Myra's stern disapproval of the hastily arranged marriage. Brady took an instant liking to Smith, a bit of a fellow tearaway. The two had spent a fair amount of time in deep discussion about society and had even tossed around the idea of robbing a bank together. Hindley had become intensely jealous of this interloper, taking the time up of her precious Ian. 26th of December 1964. Leslie Ann Downey, aged 10. On Boxing Day of 1964, 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey was snatched from a fairground in the Ancoats area of Manchester. That night, Myra Hindley had taken her grandmother to another relative's house and had refused to bring her home until the following day. What went on in that house that night, we know through one of the most vile and twisted acts of any serial killer. Brady and Hindley had made a tape recording of the ordeal. In this recording, poor Leslie Ann can be heard screaming, futilely begging for them to stop and crying for her mummy, and pleading for them not to undress her. Hindley can be heard on the tape trying to persuade her to keep quiet, either by foe comforting her or outright threats to hit her. They spent a lot of time trying to get Leslie to put something in her mouth, presumably a gag, but I dread to think what else it could have been. The end of the tape has a mixture of muffled voices and music, most notably the tunes Little Drummer Boy, and Jolly St. Nicholas. Myra then ended Leslie Ann's pain by strangling her with a length of rope. This same rope she would keep with her, in her pocket or handbag. She would fidget with it whilst in public, perhaps reliving the moment in her head as she did so. I could not find a copy of the recording, and in the end I'm quite glad about that, but I will leave a link to the transcript of the tape in the description. I will warn you, it makes for sickening reading. Whilst I read it myself for this script, I felt nothing but sadness, anguish, and extreme incandescent rage. The next morning, the couple put her body in the back of the van and drove her up to the moor to their old familiar spots where they buried her, naked, in a shallow grave. Later, Hindley would recall that, quote, After the Leslie Ann Downey murder, I didn't think in terms of redemption, but if I did, I would have said I knew I was beyond redemption, that I would never be anything other than what I had become, totally corrupt, evil, wicked. Leslie Ann's body was found in 1965 on the same visit that had found John Kilbride. Her mother identified her from the clothes that she had been wearing. On the 23rd of July 1965, which happened to be Hindley's 23rd birthday, her sister Maureen and husband David had moved into a flat in a newly built block not far from Wardlebrook Avenue. The two couples began to visit each other more regularly. David and Ian would talk long into the night about hypothetical robberies and murders. Ian had lent him some of his books and had urged him to read them and help better his perspective on society, or in other words, bring him round to Brady's twisted way of thinking. 6th of October, 1965. Edward Evans, aged 17. The couple had arranged to meet apprentice engineer Edward Evans at Manchester's Central Railway Station on the pretext of a sexual encounter and alcohol back at the house. Ian told Edward that Myra was his sister, and they both got into the car and went back to Wardlebrook Avenue. During her time on the inside, Myra, who had been previously typing out her memories of the killing spree, decided to commit her recollections to tape when her typewriter had broken. As part of the recording, in a low, almost murmuring, barely audible voice, she described the murder of Edward Evans thusly. It was on the night of the October the 6th, and I just had this awful feeling of dread. We drove to Manchester Central Station and he told me he wouldn't be long. Unfortunately, or unfortunately, Ian then appeared with this youth. Turned out he was 17, and Ian introduced him as Eddie, and I said virtually nothing on the way back. Ian had taken Edward Evans into the front room and had opened a bottle of wine, and said to me quietly, Go and get Dave. Brady was taking a huge gamble involving David Smith in their murderous adventures, but he was confident that he knew his new mate well enough that he would be game for joining in. 
Little did he know that this would be the couple's undoing. Myra returned with Smith a short time later. Smith was told to wait in the car for a short time until he saw one of the room lights flash on and off. When he saw this signal, he knocked on the front door and Brady showed him in. Myra continued on her tape. The living room was open and all I could see was blood everywhere. I stayed in the kitchen and I was sick. I just cannot stand the sight of blood. Never have been able to. I thought David Smith had killed him at first, but, but Ian said that he had hit him, Edward Evans, with the hatchet to shut him up. Brady had finally finished Evans off by strangling him with a length of electrical flex. He and Smith then wrapped the body in some plastic and dumped it in the spare bedroom. Thankfully, David Smith turned out not to be quite the protégé that Ian Brady had thought him to be. When he had got home at around 0300, not long after he was through the door, the young man broke down, telling his wife what he saw, even vomiting at the memory of it all. And so, just after 0600 the following morning, seemingly racked with guilt, put in a call to Hyde Police Station from a nearby phone box after arming himself with a knife and a screwdriver for fear that Brady and Hindley were somehow watching him. When recounting the scene to the police, David reported that, I waited about a minute or two, then suddenly I heard a hell of a scream. It sounded like a woman, really high-pitched. Then the screams carried on, one after another, really loud. Then I heard Myra shout, Dave, help him! Very loud. When I ran in, I just stood inside the living room and I saw a young lad. He was lying with his head and shoulders on the couch and his legs were on the floor. He was facing upwards. Ian was standing over him, facing him with his legs on either side of the young lad's legs. The lad was still screaming. Ian had a hatchet in his hand. He was holding it above his head and he hit the lad on the left side of his head with the hatchet. I heard the blow. It was a terrible hard blow. It sounded horrible. Armed with the evidence of David Smith's eyewitness account, the police had no trouble in securing a warrant to search the premises of Number 16 Wardlebrook Avenue. Initially, the cops maintained a ruse that they were there investigating an offence involving firearms. The pair, of course, knew nothing of any such occurrence and so were put a little at ease. Then Inspector Robert Talbot of Staley Bridge Nick asked him if he and his sergeant could look around the house. Guardedly, the pair agreed. When they found the door to a spare bedroom locked, Hindley lied and told them that she had accidentally left her keys at work. The ever helpful coppers said that it was no problem and that they could take her to go and get them. Ian Brady, sensing that the jig was up re and resigned to his fate, told Myra to just give them the key. Inspector Talbot took the key with him back upstairs. Very soon after, he came back down. Ian Brady was arrested on suspicion of murder. Myra remained free. However, she had insisted on going with them to the police station and that Evans's death was nothing more than an accident but had refused to give a statement to that effect. So, without any specific evidence to hold her at that time, she was allowed to leave. Over the next few days, she visited the cop shop every day to ask after her beloved partner. This freedom was not to last as she was arrested four days later. The police began to tear the house apart at the seams to secure the vital evidence they needed to formally charge the pair and take them to court. Much worse was to come, though, as during the search of the house, police had discovered a left luggage ticket hidden inside the spine of a Bible. Officers were dispatched to Manchester Central Railway Station. In the locker named on the ticket, they found a brown leather suitcase. In that case, they found a tape recording of the torture of Leslie Ann Downey and various photographs of her bound and gagged. All the coppers who saw the photographs were sickened to their very core. Amongst the couple's possessions was found a tartan-covered photo album. Inside, interweaved with the more innocuous snaps, were pictures of the couple on Saddleworth Moor, near to or directly on where the victim's makeshift graves were, all around the landmark of Hollin Brown Knoll, a rocky outcrop that dominated the landscape. They had clearly revisited the sites after the fact as a way of reliving their sickening deeds, of recapturing the thrill that they had felt in the taking of a life and the desire to further possess their victims in death. Even when confronted with the evidence, Brady had said nothing. He had also previously coached Myra into doing the same, long before their arrest. Some of the photos of the couple have been colorized by the YouTube channel history for You. link in the description. Based on these photographs, in October of 1965, a small army of police had headed up to Saddleworth Moor, armed with shovels and police dogs, to the spots that were in the snapshots. A huge entourage of the press were also in tow, which inevitably also attracted a huge public presence, 
One young reporter even suggested that there may have even been an ice cream van present at the roadside. If that is true, then bloody hell, talk about taking advantage. The officers moved forward in a tight line, digging as they went. It took a hell of a long time, but just as they were about to call it a day, Police Constable Spears shouted out to his superiors. He had found something. Immediately, the area was completely cordoned off and the forensic medical team brought in. P.C. Spears had stumbled across a child's finger sticking out through the peat. The boggy ground was dug out and the naked body of Leslie Ann Downey was revealed. Her clothes had been placed by her feet. After consulting the photo album again, police found one that caught their interest. It was of Myra, kneeling. Her dog couched under her a coat and arm. She appeared to be staring at some stones beneath her feet, a sardonic half-grin still visible on her partially hidden face. They managed to pinpoint the exact spot and the photo was taken and began digging. It didn't take them long to find something. But when the police turned up at John Kilbright's house, they showed his parents a shoe taken from the body they'd found. His mother let out a soul-anguished shriek and broke down in floods of tears. His dad sat in his armchair, head in his hands, weeping deeply. The one remaining shred of hope they had was now fully torn away from them. On the 6th of December 1965, the couple appeared before the magistrate's court in Hyde. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley were both formally charged with the murders of John Kilbride, Leslie Ann Downey and Edward Evans. By this point, they did not have any evidence of the murders of Keith Bennett and Pauline Reed, but three charges and the supporting evidence were more than enough to take to trial. The trial of the Moores murderers began at the Chester Assizes on the 19th of April 1966. Mr Justice Fenton Atkinson presiding. Court security was heavily strengthened, even fitting a sheet of ballistic glass on the dock for fear that someone might try and shoot at the couple. Naturally, when the charges were levelled at them, both entered pleas of not guilty. As the trial commenced, the prosecution outlined the lurid details of each murder. But it was the tape of Leslie Ann's murder that really whipped up the public into sheer naked outrage. Many began calling for the reintroduction of capital punishment, only recently suspended earlier that year, before the full abolition in 1969. As the tape was played, the faces of the silent jury turned ashen with shock. It was played to them in private, as it was deemed far too upsetting to play in open court. A handful of journalists were allowed to hear it and take transcripts. One of those reporters, Doug Pickford, later told the documentary that a little while afterwards he was out shopping when over the shop's music station came the song Little Drummer Boy. This brought the memory of that tape rushing back to his mind and caused him to flee the store. The trial would last for two weeks. Brady used his eight hours on the stand to display his arrogance and narcissism for all to see, constantly pushing back against the prosecution's assertions over the slightest detail. However, the jury were not convinced. It took them a little over two hours of deliberations. Brady was found guilty on all three counts, Hindley guilty of two, those of Downey and Evans. In his closing remarks, Mr Justice Atkins described the pair as truly horrible, two sadistic killers of the utmost depravity, and that they both stuck rigidly to their strategy of lying, and of Hindley specifically, a quiet, controlled, impassive witness who lied remorselessly. The pair were sentenced to concurrent life terms for each of their respective guilty verdicts. The judge did not impose a tariff, but it was later made a whole life sentence. Given just how dangerous he was, Brady was initially sent to HMP Durham, a Category A prison, the highest grade, followed by the infamous Parkhurst prison on the Isle of Wight. In 1985, his doctors formed the opinion that he was too mentally unstable to be kept in a normal prison, and so was switched to a secure hospital with a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. Whilst incarcerated at Ashworth Secure Hospital, Ian Brady would strike up a friendship with another patient, serial killer Graham Young, the infamous teacup poisoner, a certain topic for a future video. Both men would talk long and in-depth about their shared love of Nazism and the Third Reich, both men displayed similar personality traits of a fiercely narcissistic self-perception of high intelligence and a desire for control over the lives of others, as if you already did not have more than enough reason to hate them even more. As a further way of reaffirming some of the control that he so craved and relished, 
In 1985, Bradley began telling the papers that there were more bodies buried on the moors. Eventually, in 1987, the police took him out to that deadly place, where he was able to direct them to where the body of Pauline Reed lay. It turned out that that spot it was in one of the photographs taken from the album he had made all those years previous. He even appeared to be wearing the exact same dark sunglasses on his supervised visit than he was in the original snap. He then toyed with the police, leading them on a wild goose chase for the body of Keith Bennett. At this time, the public did not know for certain that both children were even victims of the murderous pair. Twenty years on, the suspicions were finally confirmed. Brady's lawyer later claimed that, in fact, he had led the police right to the exact spot where Keith Bennett was buried, but didn't say a word as they all walked right over his grave and continued hiking to a place where he knew they would find nothing. If this story is true, it is highly likely that Brady would have done this deliberately in order to fulfil one of the, another one of his fantasies, that he could have them all walk right past or even over Keith's grave and get one last thrill at that memory of this murder, most likely got him off. On a second visit in December of that year, he claimed to police that the spot he had led them to was in fact the right place, but they still found nothing. Hindley had said that Keith's murder had taken place in a peak gully, which would naturally lead, lead one to believe that he most likely lies somewhere on the banks of Shiny Brook, a stream that runs along the moor, a little way from where the other victims were buried. Despite the whole area around Shiny Brook being extensively scoured, they still have not found anything to date. In 2001, Brady managed to have a book clandestinely published called The Gates of Janus, or Janus, not quite sure. In it, Brady gives his own personal analysis of other famous killers. I guess it takes one to know one. If you're interested in reading it, it is still available to buy. Link in the description. Myra Hindley was first sent to the now-closed HMP Holloway. Throughout her time in prison, always adamantly maintained a distance from the act of murder themselves. She also said that Ian had masterminded the whole thing from start to finish and had carried it all out bullying and coercing her into reluctantly helping him to abduct the victims, although once Ian Brady came to hear of this, vehemently insisted that she had been a part of the whole process. Were the pair attempting to goad each other from a distance? One of them is lying, but one thing is for sure, we will now never know. It is most likely that she was simply attempting to distance herself from Brady in order to secure her eventual release. Luckily for society, the parole board were having none of it. She, like her partner in crime, would receive a whole life tariff. In 1999, Hindley was hospitalised by a brain aneurysm and was further diagnosed with angina. Myra Hindley died on the 15th of November 2002 from pneumonia. Her funeral was attended by around 10 people, none of whom were members of her family. Her ashes were scattered in Staleybridge Country Park. Determined to cling on to any form of control that he could, in 1999, Brady went on hunger strike, arguing that he should be allowed the right to die. He argued, quote, Myra gets the potentially fatal brain condition whilst I have to fight to simply die. I've had enough. I want nothing. My objective is to die and release myself from this once and for all. So you see, my death strike is rational and pragmatic. I'm only sorry I didn't do it decades ago and I'm eager to leave this cesspit in a coffin. However, his doctors countered that his mental state rendered him incapable of rationally making that decision. The courts agreed and ordered a feeding tube to be inserted. UK law does not have a specific law against people intentionally starving themselves, but there is a specific exemption under the Mental Health Act of 1983. In 2012, Brady attempted to force a return to a standard prison, claiming that he was no longer suffering from any mental illness merely so that he could have the feeding tube removed and be finally allowed to die on his own terms. His application was rejected as the judge did not believe his assertions that he was no longer mentally ill. This last attempt at control had finally resigned Brady to his fate. Ian Brady died of restricted pulmonary disease on the 15th of May 2017, arrogant and defiant to the last. There was no ceremony held for him. His body was cremated and his ashes scattered discreetly at sea. Never at any point throughout his entire period of incarceration did he express any form of remorse for his crimes. In correspondence with journalists, he never even mentioned any of his victims, merely putting on the whole woe is me shtick.
The police did not exactly distinguish themselves when in 2007 it was discovered that some small parts of Pauline Reed's body had been stored at Leeds University's forensic pathology department for over 20 years without the family's knowledge, notably some of her hair and her jaw and some other tissue samples. Once they were shamed into returning them, the family then had to reply for permission to exhume Pauline's remains for the last of these parts of her to be reburied, making her whole again. Pauline's niece, Jackie Reed, said, They said they had stumbled across some stuff. I thought it would be Pauline's gold necklace. It was a piece of her jawbone. I couldn't believe it. It was heartbreaking. We thought she was all there together. It should not have been separated. This family has been through enough. It brought it all back. I feel angry. In 2008, Hindley's former lawyer reported that she had told him, I ought to have been hanged. I deserved it. My crime was worse than Brady's because I enticed the children, and they never would have entered the car without my role. I have always regarded myself as worse than Brady. Previously in the 1990s, she had stated that the only reason she obeyed Brady's wishes was because he was blackmailing her with a raft of pornographic photographs that he had taken of her and accused Brady of drugging her. Not many people at the time believed her, and I can't for certain say that I do either. The fact that she is clearly heard on the torture tape taking an active role in the murder of Leslie Ann Downey proves beyond any doubt that she was just as fucked up as Brady. All of her small admissions were only serving as an attempt to cover up the greater truths. This was a 50-50 murderous relationship, and no mistake. On the 30th of September 2022, there was some hope that the resting place of wee Keith Bennett could well have been found after a private investigator named Russell Edwards claimed to have found a jawbone. However, eight days of searching later, alas, no luck. The search was called off once more. Now that Brady and Hindley have gone to hell, it seems unlikely that Keith's remains will ever be found, never to be given the proper burial that he deserves, forever lost in the vast expanse of the moor. His mother, Winnie, died on the 18th of August, 2012, at the age of 78. She had fought tooth and nail every day to continue the search for the body of her beloved son. Ultimately, she never got the final closure that she so desperately craved. And as things stand, neither will the rest of the family. I pray one day that changes, but given the vast expanse of the section of Saddleworth Moor where the murder was supposedly happened, it does not look good. To this day, the Shiny Brook area of the moor continues to be searched piecemeal by members of the family and a band of dedicated volunteers. The police have said that they will not be putting any more resources into the search unless there is a major evidence breakthrough. There have been suggestions that the police and others have been looking in wholly the wrong place the whole time. A couple of photographs taken from the Tartan Bound album were not taken on Saddleworth Moor, but at Ramshaw Rocks between Buxton and Leek in Staffordshire, 40 miles away. Could Brady and Hindley have been giving us the runaround all these years? Independent investigators have scoured the scene, testing the peat for depth and combing the area with dogs trained to sniff out the dead. So far, no luck. The house in Wardlebrook Avenue in Hattersley was demolished by the local council, lest it become a shrine to the many sickos out there. David and Pauline Smith became social pariahs following the trial because they had decided to sell their stories to the news of the world. Those of you familiar with that particular form of publication will probably be unsurprised by that. David was forced to admit the deal in court under threat of being found in contempt. The Smith family received mountains of hate mail, and their home was vandalised on several occasions. All of this culminated in David being sentenced to three years' imprisonment in 1969 for stabbing a man following an argument and scuffle. In December of 1986, both David and Myra had made visits to the moor to guide police to potential places to search. The moor's murderers rank among the sickest and certainly most bitterly hated in all of British criminal history. Only true unbound evil could possibly think to take the lives and the innocence of children in such an horrific manner. These young, innocent children with eyes full of life and joy were cut so tragically and horrifically short by a pair of sick, twisted fuckers who thought that they were better and smarter than everyone else. Hindley may have claimed that she was coerced, but the fact of the matter is she could have opted out at any moment by going to the police. She chose not to. What they did to those kids is beyond imaginable to the rest of us, even in our most lurid and upsetting dreams. 
Ian Brady was clearly not mad. If he had, he would not have resisted the temptation to also murder their neighbour's child, Patricia Hodges, when they had the perfect chance to do so. This, to me, proves that he was extremely careful in how he selected his victims. A psychopath would not have thought twice, acting on pure impulse. A sane person is far more calculating in their weighing up of the risks. By actively choosing not to kill Patricia, or indeed any of the other children on the estate that they had befriended, the pair revealed themselves to be no madder than you or I, dear viewer. Just messed up. Humanity is well rid of the Moors murderers, and I think I speak for everyone when I say that I hope we shall never see their like again. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative and entertaining. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing for more content on all aspects of the darker side of history. If you wish to do so, you can now support Descent into Darkness on Patreon or via the Super Thanks button. Please feel free to comment your thoughts on this case and I will try to reply to as many as I can. I found the research and writing of this episode especially interesting as it involves telling two separate stories that converge and then diverge again after they were caught almost in a kind of Pulp Fiction-esque narrative. Although, of course, the fact that this case involves children has made it <sighs> a bit of a rough ride, I'll be honest with you guys. Those that know me will tell you that, as much as I am a pacifist, there are two things that are guaranteed to get my piss boiling, and that is anything to do with cruelty to animals or children. So having to research and recount a tale such as this kind of hit the core a little bit too hard, you know, right in the feels. Of course, this opens up more possibilities to cover other similar cases, the standout example being Fred and Rose West. Any other suggestions would be greatly appreciated. In the meantime, take care of yourselves, and I will see you on our next Descent into Darkness.